Welcome to UCLA R&D Levy Center for Jewish Studies. My name is Omar Boom. I'm professor of anthropology, history, and Near Eastern languages and cultures here at UCLA, and holder of the Morris Amado Chair in Sephardic Studies, as well as the co-director with my colleague here present here, Sarah Klein, of the Moroccan Jewish Studies Program. On behalf of the UCLA and the Center for Jewish Studies, I would like to welcome you to the Maurice Amado Program in Sephardic Studies for the Fall 2022, highlighting Professor Chris Silver's work and his recent book, Recording History, Jews, Muslims, and Music Across 20th Century North Africa. The book will be available for purchase after our conversation and discussion. Uh, it's also available for those of you who would like to purchase it or recommend it to your friends and colleagues through Stanford University Press. This talk is part of the Levy Center's Mori Samada program, as I just mentioned, in Sephardic Studies series, and is co-sponsored by the UCLA Center for Levy Eastern Studies. You can find more information on these talks and other upcoming events at the registration table right there and at the back I will visit the website of the center. I want to thank the Allen D. Levy Center staff for making the arrangement for today's event and please take a moment to silence your thoughts before we start. So let me start by introducing Dr. Chris Silver which I'll call later on just Chris because we're more than colleagues, we're friends, we're family. Dr. Silver is the CEO Family Assistant Professor in Jewish History and Culture in the Department of Jewish Studies at McGill University. He earned his PhD in History from UCLA. He's one of our, our, our own. He is the author of numerous articles on North African history and music, including in the journal of North, International Journal of Middle East Studies and Esperis Tamuda, among others. He's also the founder and curator of the website Garamophones.com, a digital archive of North African records from the first half of the 20th century. His book, recording history, Jews, Muslims, and music across 20th, uh, 20th century North Africa, was just published last summer, June 2022, with Stanford University Press. <coughs> Let me begin by a a general introduction to this work before I start my conversation with uh, Chris. Over 10 years ago, at Cafe Luce in Tucson, Arizona, Chris, a recent undergraduate student from Berkeley University, came all the way to see if he can pursue a PhD in Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona. We had a great conversation about North Africa, Morocco, Jews of the Middle East and North Africa. And at the end of it, I recommend that UCLA is the best choice in working with my friend and mentor, Sarah Stein. Chris is today, in my mind and in my book, one of the, one of the, one of the undisputed leaders in the, in the scholarship of sound, music, and Jewish-Muslim relations in Middle East and Jewish studies. Chris is an unusual historian of music with unusual skills. He knows how to listen to the archives. He's adept at how to access music, and musical records across the region, especially North Africa. He's one of the best protectors of and safeguarders of North African sounds. I have followed his journey, and I talked, and I appreciated, and I as I talked to many friends across Morocco, we appreciate how all of the effort he's done in saving these records. In my book, as I just mentioned before, Chris has done more for saving these records than many national archives, and I mean that. If you have not visited his online website, Garamophone, do it please, after today's meeting. You will be one of 200,000 plus listeners who enjoy the music of Algerian, Moroccan, and Tunisian singers such as Zohra Fasiya, Albert Suisa, Salim al-Haladi, Habiba Masika, Salim Maghribi, among others. Like any archivist, Chris has made sure 
that every record is accompanied with a detailed inform in, and informative biographical note. His collection includes more than 578 RPM North African records and more. It is a unique collection that he shares on a monthly basis with the general public through his online archive gramophone. And for that, I would like really to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the work you've been, you've been doing on this. It is a special treat to have Chris today with us to celebrate his recent book. This is by far one of the best books that have been written on North African Jews through the prism of music. It shows a deep knowledge of history, of music, and global networks of the market and industry of music. Please join me in welcoming Chris Atchisele. So Chris, I would like to welcome you first, and I would like to start by a, a question about the topic and why this topic. So on page 14, Edwin, you quote and you invoke uh, Edwin Sarusi, when you say that, when we talk about the importance of studying history of Jews and Muslims through music, but how that topic has also been recorded, that has also been ignored. So you begin by saying, recorded history recovers a world of physical, visual, and audible musical documents, making it clear that sourcing music is the first, in the first half of the 20th century is not only possible, but of benefit to scholars moving forward. So tell us why is that? So, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone for being here on what is for me coming from Montreal an exceptionally hot day uh, in October, I think. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Wu and Chelsea and the incredible uh, staff here who uh, has made uh, the Levy Center, Sephardic Studies, Moroccan Jewish Studies at, at UCLA. Um, a one-of-a-kind model and something that I'm trying to replicate uh, in Montreal uh, as well. And so uh, <laughs> every every interaction uh, for me is, is a learning experience. And of course, um, my colleagues, friends, and, and family, uh, uh, Sarah and, and uh, Omar, uh, it's, it's, I feel like I'm at the Oscars a little bit, but uh, so if the music cues up, I, I will step off. But, um, Ten years ago, the journey began here, or even a, a little bit before then, in, uh, in, in Tucson. Uh, and it's incredible to be uh, sort of full circle at this moment, a decade later, uh, with this product, uh, uh, very much a, a labor of, uh, of, of love. Uh, and with uh, um, uh, mentors who became uh, not just colleagues, but uh, but uh, friends and family as well. So I, I'm deeply touched uh, to be here with, with everybody. And now I have to remember what you said about page 14. Uh, so um, the question about why music, what's... Why music? Just with the half dozen names that you mentioned, um, uh, you have uh, slices of uh, North African history uh, Jewish, Jewish Muslim, and, and otherwise, uh, that are, I would say, impossible to ignore. So one, one could ask the question, you know, what would Moroccan history be or sound like without Zohar al Fasiya or without Sami al Mughrabi, who provided uh, uh, the soundtrack uh, uh, for uh, a remarkable time in Moroccan history? Uh, the late 1940s, the 1950s, this moment uh, in which uh, Morocco is, is marching to independence, and musicians like Semin Maghrabi, Zohar al Fasiya are, are providing uh, uh, not just a soundtrack, a soundtrack, but really sort of an, an anthem, uh, providing, um, uh, in, in my uh, estimate, what the future might uh, sound, sound like. Uh, and so, you know, any history that's not inclusive of these individuals, uh, of these sounds, from my perspective, and I think many others as well, is doing an injustice to the history itself. And so uh, you mentioned um, 
uh, uh, I think Edwin Sarusi, or, or I invoke Edwin Sarusi in the book, who, um, alongside Ziad Fahimi uh, uh, in uh, Middle East history, uh, both of them uh, sort of uh, speak to this uh, incredible and persistent phenomenon in which um, you turn to the indices of most uh, modern Jewish history books or modern uh, Middle East history books, and music is, is nowhere to be found, uh, nowhere to be found in, in, uh, in the index. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a glaring omission, and, and this, is, um, this is what Sarusi is uh, speaking about. This is what uh, Fahmi is uh, doing in terms of attempting to offer uh, a corrective. Um, uh, the past had uh, a sound, it had many sounds, it had many overlapping sounds, and I think uh, we need to be listening for it as much as we need to be uh, reading for it as well. So do you think that in the field of Middle Eastern studies, in particular, that you are trying also to engage, do you think that uh, the work that you and Ziad Fahmi are doing is opening now a space for other scholars to uh, engage with this topic and to try to understand these Middle Eastern and North African societies through the prism and by using through the lens of music? I think so. I, I, you know, I can point to a few things. I mean, one, one of the interventions I'm making as well is to sort of, um, I, I, I would like when we're thinking about sort of the music of the wider region, when we think about someone like Um Tansu, to be able to invoke a Habib Masika as well, or Luisa Tunsia, or Ratib al Shami. I mean, there's sort of there are many uh, names that are uh, worthwhile uh, uh, of invoking. Uh, there are many histories there. Uh, this was never just a single uh, musician or a single uh, star, but we sort of. Re in some ways, it's, it's been reduced to that. I mean, often we sort of, it's Unkatsum, it's Feiruz, and then we, we sort of stumble uh, uh, upon sort of anyone uh, west of, of Egypt. So part of this is also an intervention to make sure that uh, we, we recognize that there was uh, a thriving industry uh, and scene and multiple scenes, again, across uh, uh, not just the Middle East, but uh, uh, North Africa as well. And, um, you know, I f I'm cautiously optimistic that we're at a moment of change. Uh, so, um, <laughs> if Stanford University Press is sort of like a bellwether of, of things to come, you know, we can speak of three books this year alone uh, that come out of their Middle East series and sometimes overlap with uh, their Jewish Studies series as well uh, that treat uh, music. Uh, uh, by historians, so not ethnomusicologists. And what I think that, that does, uh, when done well, is sort of make music accessible to people who uh, are taken by these sounds, but can't always sort of give an ethno ethnomusicological explanation as to why or who, what exactly is, is happening. So, uh, you know, we can point to uh, Andrew Simon's book on uh, cassette culture in, in Egypt. So this is uh, a later history, 1970s uh, forward. Uh, uh, Hanan Hamad's book on uh, Leila Murad uh, as well. Um, so all of these in, in quick uh, succession uh, in 2022 uh, alone. And so we sort of knowing how the, the academic pipeline works, that there are things, uh, there, are, there are other things afoot. And I'm encouraged, uh, I'm encouraged by that. I mean, one other thing I, I, I wanna say is that, you know, part of my intervention here is that um, uh, sort of we have, uh, sort of a cutting edge musical technology that, that dates to the 19th century. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it feels or has felt uh, lost to time, uh, in part because of the medium, and in part because it was uh, uh, decades before sort of the, the technologies that would eventually come to replace it. Um, but that history is recoverable. Uh, and you know it's it's worth recovering just uh, for its own sake, uh, but also because I mean what it reveals is so um, is so is so 
vibrant, it's so uh, loud, cacophonous. It sort of, uh, from my vantage point, it, it upends uh, a lot of sort of some inherited truths about uh, the region that um, it it's makes the, that pursuit all, all the worthwhile. That's correct. Now, having set up this general theoretical and uh, context, I want to go back to the personal. I, I think every research and every story and every personal engagement with a topic, there is a personal uh, part of it. So, so why, uh, can you tell us a little bit how this engagement, because you're not only doing this as, as a researcher, but you're also really engaged with the public. There is, you, you, the public is, is a central part of what you're doing, and if you go online and your engagement with um, the media and all these uh, uh, other forms of, 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 uh, of public engagement, it's really, I, it's really remarkable. So I want to, if you can tell us a little bit why, where this interest comes from on a personal level, before we get to the book. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, the again, the the people in this room, I'm talking away from the mic. The people from this room helped uh, guide this path. So I'm thinking of you, Omar. I'm thinking of, of Sarah as well, who uh, were never uh, content with sort of state archives uh, alone or formal uh, institutions alone. Uh, I'm also looking at Rachel now. But I mean, there's, you know, there is an understanding, especially here, that what people have um, stored away in attics, in, in basements, uh, in a shoebox. It could be uh, a, an incredible trove of documents, or it could be a, a single uh, image or uh, a recording or, or whatever it is, um, has incredible value and uh, provides us with an, an understanding of the past that uh, is just is not there in the sort of the, 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 the archives that historians have, have tended to favor. Um, and so, you know, that sort of, that thinking was very much nurtured here. Um, uh, you know, um, this is not a paid uh, plug for, for UCLA. I think mean, it's really from the bottom of my heart. Um, uh, personally, I found that, um, I, first of all, I, I guess I can say, that, to be perfectly candid, um, I don't know why Morocco in the first place. Um, it, wasn't some, it wasn't like, a, there's no story that like from a young age I always gravitated toward, uh, toward that place. Um, it, it happened to, to pique my interest thanks to a, a mentor uh, at Berkeley, Emily Gottreich, um, who that was her particular area of, uh, of interest. Um, and you know the, the the personal here is um, you know the, this the, the story I, I tell as as often as as people ask it is that you know I was in Casablanca one day uh, walking down the street as as people do it was two thousand nine uh, and I happened uh, upon an actual record store uh, huh. not selling CDs not selling uh, cassettes actual uh, vinyl records and and I was. Um, intrigued by that in 2009 in Casablanca, and um, I had just developed an interest in sort of um, all outdated forms of, of media, so uh, records, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, and uh, and the like. And I sort of just found my my way to that. And the proprietor of the store very graciously gave me uh, a sonic tour of what what uh, stock was still there. So I knew nothing of. Uh, Moroccan music, or very little of Moroccan music, and I asked, uh, uh, I promised I would purchase some things, and I asked uh, the proprietor to play some records on the aging turntable in the store, and from the moment that uh, the, the, the spoken announcement uh, started, so uh, North African uh, records, also Middle Eastern records, other places around the world, uh, have traditionally traditionally started with a spoken announcement where the record label is announced. So some people will know this or remember this, Istwanat, and then whatever the, the label is, Istwanat, by the phone, Istwanat, uh, Sabah, whatever it is. Uh, and then the name of the artist, the song, and, and other details, and it's just, it's an experience that really draws you in uh, to, that, to, that, uh, to that music. Uh, and I, I was already sort of hooked, 
And then the proprietor sort of whispered to me after every other record that was played for no particular reason, but uh, something that set me on this, on this current uh, uh, path. Uh, by the way, that was uh, Zohar al Fasia, and she was Jewish, or that was Samuel Maghrabi, and, 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 uh, and he was a, a Jewish artist. And um, I, I thought there was a, a there there. I, I sort of felt like um, sort of historical inquiry, inquiry often begins with a whisper like that. Uh, sort of, sort of uh, someone with deep knowledge, uh, not necessarily sort of a, a, a trained historian, but someone who uh, is sort of has been trained by life to understand uh, their past, um, set me on this path. And I um, purchased these records. Uh, came to know them much better and thought uh, there's no reason why they should rest in my uh, living room alone, but I want to have them uh, live again in, in other spaces. And I also imagine that there were people out there who knew much more about this than I did uh, and that I could have that uh, back and forth with. And, and this is what you're alluding to, and, and that has been uh, my great uh, fortune and, and uh, uh, pleasure um, since that, that fateful moment in, in 2009 where, you know, there are, I think we all know, but there are people who are constantly um, Googling the same family name over and over again, hoping for some glimmer of, uh, of information or detail. Uh, and, and, and in fact, the, the repetitive nature of these Google searches, in fact, uh, uh, improves them. <laughs> and so uh, every once in a while they hit on something that I digitized and uploaded and tried to contextualize and then I made myself as, as accessible as possible uh, and they would get in touch and inevitably I would end up in uh, a living room in uh, Paris or Tunis or Tel Aviv or, or, or whatever it is. And the photographs came out, and uh, family stories uh, uh, came out, and I was able also to provide um, the actual voices of these loved ones that they hadn't heard in, in some cases in, in decades. Um, and then also sometimes I was able uh, to furnish uh, an intelligence report uh, from, uh, from uh, the French colonial authorities and these people had no idea that their record store was ever under surveillance or in fact their great grandfather was engaged in subversive anti-colonial behavior and thus a, a, another conversation. But that's, but that's really, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think that that's really one of the most I think one of the most powerful contributions in, in, in your work. I think you, your work has a history. You, you begin, begins with the archive, but it never stops at the archive. It really has a life after life. It continues into the moment. So I want to go back to that prehistory before we get to talk about what's going on right now and where you're taking this research. And so one of, one of the... Uh, Everything begins with the label, with these labels, and the commercial, <coughs> the context of this label, the social context of these labels, and the market of these labels, the commercialization of these labels. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we get to the singers, the singers who are engaged in this? What is, what is the context, not only Morocco, I think you're talking about Algeria, you're talking about Tunisia, you're talking about Morocco, and, metro and, 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 the, and the metropole, and the French metropole. Yeah, that's a good um, that's a good place to start. Indeed, so I mean the the context is um, you know the birth of recording technology in the nineteenth uh, century, sort of the middle of uh, the nineteenth century. Uh, we get the the very first uh, recording of uh, before uh, Edison. We have uh, Au Clair de la Lune. Uh, we have a, an incredible recording of, of that uh, from. Um, 1860, or, the, or quite early, eventually we'll get to, we'll eventually get to Mary had a little lamb on a, on a piece of uh, a tin foil. Um, we'll arrive at a moment in which uh, recording already in its early days is sort of in this uh, state of flux. So some of the technology is there, but the question is, uh, you know, to which to which end is this going to be the latest uh, dictation software of the late 19th century? That's one image or understanding of, of where this may lead, uh, or is it going to be something more 
frivolous, uh, quote unquote, which is uh, music, uh, an ability to, to record music in a way that differs, of course, from, uh, from notation. Um, you know, in parallel with the, the birth of the recording industry uh, in some of some better known places, let's say North America uh, or, or Europe, uh, recording explodes across the world, and this includes North Africa uh, and uh, and the Middle East. Uh, and already, uh, you know, by the, the the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, in a moment where. Um, it's so funny to say this out loud because I can I can feel us all in the weeds right now or my own weeds. Um, in the moment where the cylinder, the wax cylinder, which spawned at 160 rotations per minute and held a couple of minutes uh, of music uh, in total, from the moment that we get from that Edison cylinder to the Berliner disc, uh, sort of the flat disc uh, as we as we know it, that eventually would um, uh, would arrive at. Uh, 25 centimeters in diameter, 10 inches in diameter, holding three minutes of music per side, hence you know, the perfect pop song being uh, three minutes uh, in length. Um, at that very moment that this is happening uh, with labels like Columbia, Victor, uh, Gramophone uh, in North America, Europe, uh, elsewhere it's also happening in North Africa, in the Middle East. Uh, so the international labels will descend on uh, North Africa, uh, recognizing that there's a great market there um, and that there are uh, multiple uh, languages at play, there are multiple styles, so it's not all Andalusian music, it's also popular music, uh, it's not all Arabic, it's also uh, Shidha, it's uh, Kabir, it's uh, the various languages of North Africa, it's Hebrew uh, as well, so Hebrew liturgical and paraliturgical music. Uh, are, uh, are recorded. And then we also have the rise of the independent label, uh, the rise of a, of a class of largely Jewish, not entirely, but largely Jewish uh, impresarios who recognize that um, the music scene can become a music industry. Uh, and uh, what we're talking about is sort of, it's no uh, flash in the pan uh, phenomenon already by uh, the years between the two world wars. So uh, by the 1920s, uh, we're talking about thousands of individual uh, records uh, released, meaning uh, individual uh, songs or, or pieces of the repertoire. Uh, uh, meaning that tens of thousands, and in some cases, low hundreds of thousands of records are circulating across North Africa by the 1930s. So um, this is a tremendous amount of, uh, of material uh, that in many ways it is everywhere because uh, the 1930s is also the moment when we get the rise of, of radio uh, in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia across the Mediterranean. The same is true in metropolitan France. So um, this industry has really come into its own in the 1930s. It's robust and it existed even though sometimes we might feel like it did it because we, we couldn't find the records in the first place. Great. So so who was listening to this uh, in terms of the audience, uh, in terms of class? If you can just a little bit before we get so to So the I would say it, you know, it's always the, the easy answer is that everybody is listening uh, to this. Uh, part of the, the class equation is uh, who owns a phonograph. Okay. Um, and so, you know, what's nice about the photographs, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, is um, that they uh, don't need to be plugged in. Uh, they're, they're wound. And so uh, what this means is that they, you don't need to be on the grid, um, and so this can be uh, in sort of the most, uh, a photograph can be found in the most uh, humble of cafes, uh, as well as in uh, the royal palace, in, in, in the Moroccan case uh, as well. Um, but if you look uh, both at the sort of the more traditional archival records of the French archives, um, uh, photographs uh, are everywhere, and uh, Jews and Muslims are, are listening to music often together and everywhere. Uh, and part of the concern on the part of the French authorities is that it's bringing multiple classes together who wouldn't otherwise come together. Um, the, the music is also, especially when we get into the popular realm, is sort of um, 
is is served at this level is sort of is uh, is is thought up and then presented at this level where it has to uh, appeal to uh, we're moving away from class a little bit but sort of uh, multiple generations. It's music, uh, as as um, as one scholar put it, uh, that fathers and daughters alike were supposed to be able to listen to, um, and so in some cases, uh, this meant that they're they're really. The, the music is, is pushing the envelope in, 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 uh, in, in new directions. Uh, it's got a sort of a, a modern aesthetic to it, either uh, musically or, or, or lyrically. Um, but again, you know, sort of from the most uh, humble to those with, um, with just a sort of boundless means, uh, everyone is, is listening to this. And, and you find it in memoirs as well. It's not just in, in the archival. Uh, record, but you find this in memoirs. Um, uh, Raul Giorno, who's one of the great uh, Tunisian uh, artists, born in 1911, uh, born in, in a particularly uh, difficult uh, section of the Hara uh, in, in Tunis, uh, recalls that there was a photograph in his neighborhood at a, at a local haunt, at a cafe there, and that was his first introduction to um, uh, records. It was his first introduction to Egyptian music because uh, records were circulating uh, not just in North Africa, but uh, across to the Middle East as well. I'm going to shift gears and move to a different topic here. And I want to move to one of the stars of the book, Abinu Masih. And this, I want, if you can talk to us a little bit about this uh, singer and the importance, her importance, not only in, in the Tunisian context, but also in the broader North African context. I want to Plug also a, a, a note here, plug in a note here that really highlights the, the, one of the beauties of the book is that you really focus on women as much as men. And I think that's, I think that's really an addition to, I saw, I see it as something that's really important as far as how we, we talk about gender issues and how music is also one way to highlight those. And so if you can talk to us a little bit about this character and why you, you center her at the beginning before we get to World War II, before you get to the Yeah, thanks. I mean, she's an incredible, um, <coughs> she was an incredible person uh, for those who, who, who know her or, or don't. Um, uh, sort of the first superstar uh, across North Africa. Um, so uh, born in, in Tunis in, in 1903. Um, Habiba Mesik. Habiba Mesik. Habiba Mesik. Habiba Mesik. Mm. Uh, born in Tunis in 1903 uh, to, uh, again, a, a working class uh, Jewish family, which is a, which is a theme of, of the book, again, to this, this issue of, uh, of class. And she comes from... Um, uh, she comes from music. Uh, her father uh, is a musician who records uh, a little bit. Uh, she's got an aunt and uncle who are also uh, in the in the recording industry. Um, she is uh, a popular artist, although she also dabbles in the the, the classical high art uh, and illusion repertoire. Um, but really, she um, is known for uh, her popular music, which, it, which again, pushes the envelope. It's, um, uh, it challenges uh, social norms. It, it, it challenges uh, where women's place is supposed to be uh, in society, uh, what it means to be modern. She does this uh, not only through um, uh, her, her uh, lyrics, uh, where she sings, um, you know, she sings quite provocatively. So um, she sings uh, this this um, uh, this uh, song about a, a lover, uh, and and the sort of the the, the the conceit of the song is so she she introduces she introduces uh, how she had this lover uh, and how she could never forget him. Okay, so already sort of like uh, pushing, uh, pushing the bounds of, of, of what's, uh, what's acceptable. Uh, and she repeats this over and over again. And then she moves on to what she names as a second lover. Uh, and the question is, how could she forget him uh, either? And then she continues on to a third, fourth, and fifth. And so, you know, I, I mean, what she's, what she's doing here, I mean, you know, we could, we could read it in a few different ways. This, this is popular music, and that's always what, what popular music uh, has been. But she's someone uh, who is 
uh, adored uh, by uh, the masses, uh, Jewish and, uh, and Muslim. Uh, her, that popular music has an impact on people, her presence has an impact on people, uh, from, again, sort of uh, those, um, those who, who, who don't always get history written about them, to figures like uh, Habib Bourguiba, uh, the first uh, president of uh, independent Tunisia and its longtime uh, president, who writes in, who, who also uh, was an actor, whose brother was an important actor in Tunisia, who acted uh, alongside Habib Masika, and he talks about the impact that she had on him in the 1920s. He talks about skipping French class to go see her uh, on stage or, or in uh, in concert. Um, and you know what I also try and do in the book is is as best I can really to write across North Africa. Uh, sometimes we do this in titles that it sort of it, it works to say North Africa instead of um, you know Morocco or Algeria. Um, but her popularity was not limited to Tunisia by, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, very popular in Algeria where she's sort of credited with um, said she was also a, a, an, an actor so she was credited with um, setting um, uh, the Algerian stage, sort of setting it on its on its path, uh, adored in uh, in Morocco as well. Um, she uh, records uh, in Berlin, uh, also in in the 1920s. Uh, and you know what makes her uh, in part an incredible figure is because of of, of tragedy, of, of her tragic uh, circumstances. Uh, she's uh, murdered in, in 1930 at the age of, at the age of 27. Uh, in really uh, brutal uh, circumstances, the victim of, of male violence. Uh, and that story, it, her story doesn't end in 1930, and, and one of the, the challenges before me was um, how to write uh, this history beyond the superficial, because we, we can imagine how it lends itself uh, to the superficial, right? Sort of like a pioneering uh, flapper in interwar uh, Tunisia, uh, which, is, which is all true, um, but I wanted to get beyond that, and it's difficult because, you know, had she lived longer, we could envision a situation where she wrote uh, a memoir. Uh, and so this is what uh, many in Egypt uh, did, uh, and thus sort of secured their legacy in that way. Presented, of course, a very particular story, but, but did it that way. Um, she left us uh, through no fault of her own, she left us uh, no such uh, documents. So one of the ways I tried to reconstruct her story is also sort of thinking about the, imp the musical impact uh, of, of, of her uh, and her history. And so, you know, in the immediate aftermath of her death, death and this is, you know, what in, in some cases bringing, um, what recovering actual uh, phonograph records brings to, to, this, uh, to this history, um, uh, something uh, on the order of, of eight or ten individual recordings by major stars of the time uh, about uh, Mount Habiba Masika or um, the death of Habiba Masika. Uh, in some cases, uh, one artist in particular um, saying of Habiba Masika uh, as, as if it was Quranic uh, recitation. I, I mean, just the like incredible um, sort of, um, you get a sense of her impact in that her music continued to circulate after her, uh, her death, uh, but songs about her also circulated uh, in the aftermath of her death, and these were among the best sellers of the time. And, I, and again, the reason I can, I can say that with confidence is because uh, we have, I have, um, the uh, production sheets uh, from the record plants of the 1930s in which uh, the number of records related to Habiba Masika and others as well, but related to Habiba Masika uh, are marked by those working in the plant. So, you know, 5,000 going to Tunisia, 2,000 going to Morocco, etc. And so we can begin to speak about, you know, what the hits were, uh, not through sort of a surmising or, 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 or guesswork, but really we get some, some incredible numbers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's how I attempted to, to, to re-narrate her, her life. That's good. I'm looking at time. Yeah, because, so, uh, but, but we have a lot. We haven't even scratched the surface. Long, long in the tooth. We haven't even scratched it. But, uh, so I want to I move a little bit further and talk about the 1940s, the war, the period of the war. I really, I really believe that one of the best chapters that have been written about World War II 
and how North Africans talk about World War II, talk about Vichy and the Nazis, period, is, is, is the, I think it's chapter three or chapter four. four yeah. Chapter four. I love that chapter, and, and I, I think, uh, I'm biased, but, but, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a chapter that really, in, in the absence of a lot of what North Africans, would, as we're writing this history, you do it really in an amazingly beautiful and way through music. Can you uh, elaborate on that? To the, uh, yeah, the thank you. Uh, so this is, um, chapter four, I think was the hardest chapter for me to write um, because this is the chapter that deals with, uh, with World War II. Uh, and um, I had to deal much more in, in silence uh, in some cases uh, than, than with music. Uh, and so the, the reason for that is because of um, the onset of, of Vichy rule in, um, in, in North Africa. Um, Jews are removed from the soundscape. Um, so the uh, anti-Jewish racial laws uh, come to affect, for example, uh, radio and who can perform on radio, uh, and Jews are no longer, for the most part, able to perform on uh, Algerian radio, radio uh, Tunisian radio, and to a lesser degree, uh, Moroccan radio as well. And so, you know, how to write about the sudden absence of uh, voices at a really critical moment in history is quite, uh, I found that quite uh, a challenge. Um, uh, and it's also a, a period, as you know well, where um, we're, um, we're, we're challenged by our historical actors who um, make decisions in, in real time that, that are challenging. Uh, and um, how to sort of, um, how to approach World War II and the Holocaust in North Africa, understanding the European context, but also understanding that uh, the European context is different. Um, it's connected, but it, it's different. Uh, and so one of the challenges that I, that I uh, had to deal with was also uh, this figure of uh, Mahideen Bashtarzi, um, who, for whom the uh, Algerian National Theater is, is named uh, to this day, uh, among the most important uh, figures of uh, Algerian music in the, the 20th century, but really, really modern history. Uh, he's someone uh, who um, emerges from uh, the mosque. Um, he's, uh, he's one of the great uh, reciters of Quran in, uh, in Algiers at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and the mosque is situated quite close to the office of an Algerian Jew, by the name of Edmond Nathan Yafir, who hears this voice and says to him, in not even as, as nice of words as these, hey kid, you're wasting your time, you could be doing something much more important, and, and plucks him from the mosque and makes him uh, the major star of, uh, of Algerian music uh, in uh, the teens, 20s, uh, 30s. Uh, he's known as the Caruso of the desert, you know, they're giving these uh, really uh, unfortunate names, but uh, he's, um, he's a major, major figure, uh, and he's someone who often finds himself as um, uh, deeply embedded in a Jewish milieu. Um, so he finds himself in uh, the premier Andalusian orchestra, uh, at the head of this premier Andalusian orchestra uh, in the teens, in the 20s, and beyond him, almost to one, everyone else is, uh, is an Algerian Jew. He's very comfortable in this milieu. Uh, he considers them in that uh, family. Uh, and yet he takes a very um, uh, disquieting turn uh, during uh, the Second World War, uh, where he begins singing the praises of uh, Vichy, uh, Pétain, um, and, uh, and spe starts speaking the language uh, of, uh, of, of the era in some ways. And so how to deal with that? Someone you sort of you come to know through historical research uh, who takes this disquieting turn was very difficult. Uh, and you know, what I think helped me just as like a, a, a human who's also a historian to sort of try and figure this out was um, recognizing that, that 
wasn't the norm. Um, and so he made uh, a decision, uh, a decision uh, in which he obviously could not see the future or that Vichy was going to come to uh, an end, uh, and that other uh, Muslim uh, musicians who were also deeply embedded in uh, this Jewish milieu uh, looked completely askance at the Vichy diktats, uh, looked askance at what was happening to their, their Jewish uh, colleagues, and, and stepped up for them uh, in, in a number of of, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, and so let me just say that that was sort of the, the challenge of, of what to do with figures like that. I should, I should also add that um, his relationship with the Jewish community will rebound after the war. So he'll maintain a relationship uh, with some of the uh, former members of this uh, Andalusian orchestra uh, from their what we might call from their exile in metropolitan France uh, after uh, the 1960s. So through the 1980s, he will, he will be writing letters back and forth with, with former uh, members of, uh, of his orchestra. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was um, amplify the other uh, sounds, uh, including recorded music, uh, of North Africa of the, the period to enrich that soundscape a little bit. So uh, to the one, if you ask someone sort of, you know, like give, give us the soundtrack of World War II in North Africa, uh, the answer will be Medican. Okay, a song by uh, a Moroccan uh, musician, uh, Hussein Slawi. Uh, it's a song about um, uh, American soldiers in Morocco uh, and um, uh, the chaos that ensues as they're pursuing women, uh, handing out um, candy and cigarettes and, and things like that. And, and chewing gum, exactly. Um, but there was. There were other takes on American arrival. There were other takes on, on what the post-war uh, environment uh, looked like, and those were also uh, recorded. Uh, and so um, I wanted to, uh, to, to amplify those sounds as well. So I, I have a lot of other questions, but I have one, I'm going to ask, uh, ask one last question because I really want to give the space for the, for the audience to, for a few questions before the end. So. Um, of all of these conversations that, that we had about different forms and different genres of music, today the majority of the discussions are about Andalusian music. So if you can talk a little bit about where you place Andalusian music in this spectrum and what it means today in the conversations about convivencia, about the politics of conflict that you see in the Middle East and other parts of the world. And so how how you situate this genre and in relation to all of these other debates? And then where do you see second part of where do you see future conversations about this topic, music and North African studies? Uh, two great questions. Um, so um, and delusion music is important. Uh, it's uh, it's important because it's, it was important to many of these historical actors. It continues to be uh, important to this day in, in various uh, ways. I mean, it's also, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, for those who don't know, this is the, the, the multimodal uh, sweet music uh, of North Africa, uh, regarded as a classical music, often regarded uh, as a national music as well, and as the only national music until very uh, uh, recently. Uh, and it's something that uh, throughout the 20th century, as much as our uh, historical actors uh, gravitated toward it for its importance, uh, for its connections to uh, this, you know, a, a remarkable past in medieval Islamic Iberia, you know, a, a, a more than a nod, a, um, uh, an invocation of this, of this, the, the, the centuries-long uh, uh, moment uh, of Andalus Farad as, as the ornament uh, of the world. Um, it was also always instrumentalized by the state. Um, so this is uh, this includes uh, the French colonial uh, authorities, but also the independence governments in, in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Uh, which means that um, uh, scholars have, you know, by and large, when when we're writing about North African music, by and large, it's about uh, uh, Andalusian uh, music, uh, which for me is problematic because. 
what happens to uh, Shabi or different types of popular music, what happens to Gnawa, what happens to uh, Stembeli, what happens to Rebaibiya, what happens to uh, all of the other uh, uh, traditions that are, are there uh, and that were also important to our historical actors. So in the book, I, um, I, uh, I, I think I nod in motion, uh, may, maybe like some sort of manic uh, conductor to uh, Andalusian music, but I really try to, uh, to amplify uh, the, the popular music that was so uh, often uh, denigrated um, by uh, colonial authorities, by uh, the elite. Uh, it was really the music that uh, people um, latched onto and, and which enabled them to uh, envision themselves anew, sort of speaking of uh, different forms of, of understanding themselves as modern and in, and, and doing so in Arabic. Uh, also, uh, when we speak about anti-colonial music, uh, national music, um, this was not drawn from the Andalusian tradition uh, by and large. And so um, what I'm trying to do is give a space and provide an opening uh, for the multiple, uh, sometimes overlapping, but multiple forms of, uh, of, uh, of, of music in, in North Africa, uh, including popular. Um, the, the second question is where do I see this going? Yeah. By the way, just to, as a comment, I really, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that censorship of the Andalusian <laughs> in the book. I think I think it made it's distanced your work from and you brought something really different. Not, not only I think you also it's an awakening in the field. And I that's one of the things I really appreciated about that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'll be known as the person who took down Al Andalus. That's uh, good. <laughs> uh, so then, so the, the, my, my last question is about the field. Where do you see the field? We, you we already touched upon it in the beginning. But I think it's something also, uh, and what, what themes that you see that are not, uh, that you and uh, your other colleagues who have worked on, on this topic have been working on, where you see more work be done? From, from my perspective, um, this book is just a, a scratching of the surface. Um, and so um, I, I I see the field as, as wide open, but in, in sort of the most positive of ways. Um, I, I hope this provides an opening uh, for, for uh, further inquiry. So, um, you know, um, there's much more that could be said about um, music as an industry, not just in the first half of the 20th century, but in the second half, uh, up, until, uh, up until the present as well. You know, sort of, you know, how we get from cylinders to Spotify and how uh, the musicians of today are uh, informed about sort of, you know, where, where the industry once was and sort of uh, provided the infrastructure of today. And, you know, you know the, um, this is, you know when you like catch yourself saying something out loud that no, if anyone was following uh, the DJ Snake phenomenon uh, of this summer or knows anything of what, so just for a second, sort of uh, much of popular music of the last decade um, is indebted uh, to uh, uh, a French producer half, uh, of half Algerian origin uh, who goes by the name of, uh, of DJ Snake. Um, uh, if that was on your bingo card today, congratulations. <laughs> um, and this summer, he um, uh, filmed or released uh, an incredible uh, music video uh, about Algeria, dedicated to the people of Algeria, and also dedicated to the format of the cassette. Okay, so this is whatever year we're in, 2022. Uh, um, uh, the cassette, you know, of course, is now decades old. Um, this mega producer and star um, released uh, his music uh, on streaming platforms as well as on a cassette that you could uh, that you could uh, 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 purchase. And so, you know, he's constantly paying homage to this past. Uh, uh, Algerians around the world were quite taken with this video, which uh, this uh, music video and the music itself, which was quite uh, stunning. And one of the things he does is he spotlights um, a cassette distributor and producer in uh, Oran, in Oran. 
Uh, that site, again, you know, I, I, we might be thinking just sort of in terms of a musical bubble here, uh, but that's one of the sites that uh, the French president visited uh, recently uh, in a bid to secure uh, oil uh, for uh, France in the midst of sort of our, uh, our, our global moment. Uh, and he's there and he's holding up cassettes and he's paying homage to this place. Uh, and so it's no trivial matter, it's no uh, minor matter, it really becomes uh, a minor, uh, a matter of uh, the highest echelons uh, of of, uh, of, of state. So understanding sort of that the cassette once existed that the, and there was media before then is, is, uh, is, is quite uh, important in my view. Uh, but again, it's wide open. For example, radio. Radio. Um, we sort of, the, the, uh, the narrative we have about uh, radio uh, is, is very much sort of um, indebted to Fanon. Uh, very much understood as sort of um, uh, a, a weapon of, uh, of the disenfranchised only at a certain moment in time. Um, but there's much more to that story. Um, there were many ways that uh, radio was uh, used by uh, Jews and Muslims in an earlier period, uh, not just the 1950s, but already in the 1930s, uh, to serve their own particular uh, aims. Uh, and uh, there's been some scholarship on, on radio, but there's much more to be done. I have a piece that's coming out uh, in, in 2023 uh, about uh, a Jewish program that existed on uh, Radio Tunis. Uh, from 1939 to 1956, uh, and it was called the Hebrew Hour, uh, although it was in a mixture of uh, French and Arabic. Uh, there was also a Jewish radio in uh, Morocco from 1950 until 1965. Uh, and so all of the sudden, sort of what a place sounded like, again, we can, we can start to imagine, envision, and, and carry uh, research uh, forward. Thank you. I think Thank you. Are we allowed for a few minutes? So I want to open the floor for a few questions. We're going to take three or four questions from the audience. Hi, my name is uh, Lee. I was born in Libya. My father, I am uh, a Moroccan. I was born in Marrakesh. My parents are Moroccan. They uh, married at uh, 1943. And uh, they... Uh, my dad was uh, very much in love with the uh, Moroccan music, so he used to go to, so I have a lot of pictures in our albums of these musicians, mm -hmm. dating my mom, so he took her as well. Mm -hmm. and we have, uh, so I grew up listening to Zohar, Fasiya, uh, Sami Boribi, and in fact, we moved to Israel mm -hmm. in 1962, so like all the like, like million of us from mm -hmm. Morocco, we all brought Moroccan music to Israel. Oh. And uh, definitely, so we carry those uh, records with us. But we, the youngsters who still was born in Morocco, and we spoke Arabic, we speak Arabic and uh, Moroccan Arabic, and French and Hebrew now, we rejected our parents' music. We didn't want to listen to that. And I uh, want to mention that one artist that my parents really loved as well. He was famous in Israel, he's drawn out, and probably mm -hmm. you know him, he, he, he definitely moved to Canada, mm -hmm. and Montreal, and then. So um, I appreciate listening to this, because yes, I, it's part of my identical history, and, um, and you did not um, touch, you started and then about the Andalusic uh, uh, music or, uh, or style, that was very much influenced, and I remember we used to go to the synagogue in holidays, mm -hmm. Jewish synagogue, and we would listen to the Allah, mm -hmm. which is was you, you know the I'm sure you know the term. So that was very much influenced by the Spanish, yeah. And uh, then my last thing is that I really want to say that um, this music is not dying. I came back from Israel. I went to my my niece' wedding, and before wedding we do the henna, which is a ceremony. The entire evening, and now we're talking about the 20s, I mean, young, young adults in their 20s getting married, they all do, if they have some Moroccan um, uh, history, they all do the henna, and the entire evening is Moroccan 
Jewish music that was influenced by Muslim and Spain and uh, North Africa. So the younger generation, we rejected it because, you know, the history, so the young ones now are really going to that. And Miri Masika is one of them, and many, many more. So as thank, you. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, you very want, much. Do you want to comment on that? No, just, yeah. uh, just, just to say thank you for sharing that. Um, and. Um, Again, if we needed any more importance, like would your parents have met uh, or married in 1943, if not for the dates uh, that involved uh, music. Uh, but um, yes, I, I just wanted to say, you know, one of the important points I think you raise is that um, it, it, there are some moments that we might point to as moments of rupture, right? The sort of like the, pu the generational pushing back um, that, that's, of course, something different in the Israeli context because it's, it's, uh, it's a cultural pushing back as well. You know, often we, we push back against the music of our parents, but when there's that added sort of what the direction of the state is, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, something, uh, it's something else. Um, but uh, Joe Amar is someone who's in the book uh, as well um, because he starts recording uh, in Arabic uh, before he becomes uh, a star of, of the Hebrew language, before he becomes uh, the first uh, uh, Moroccan, North African to appear at Carnegie Hall. Um, but um, that's something that I, I, I speak about in the book because before he was Joe Amar, uh, he went by the stage name of Joe Amar al Maghrebi, uh, Joe Amar the Moroccan. Uh, and he uh, sang uh, in Arabic, uh, continued to do so in Israel, and he also sang about the Moroccan condition uh, in Israel, about the difficulties uh, in particular that were, um, that were placed on, on Moroccans because of, uh, of, uh, of discrimination. And what's also remarkable uh, is that his records uh, that he releases in Israel on a, um, uh, a label that's uh, sort of a, an alternative non-mainstream label, when the mainstream labels wouldn't touch Jews who were singing in Arabic, there was one label in, in Jaffa that, that, that would and that did and that gave him his career, uh, Zakifon or Kodifon, which, which still exists uh, until this day. And his records, in fact, uh, as soon as they were released uh, in Israel, uh, made their way uh, to Morocco uh, and to Algeria as well. And so in the 1960s, at this moment where we sort of think uh, that those connections are difficult or impos impossible, uh, or we've read a sort of about how there's no post, right? There's no letter writing uh, between these places. Uh, the physical records are actually moving there, uh, which, is sort of, uh, which is sort of incredible. I, I was taken by your your comment uh, that your your parents uh, brought these records uh, with them when they departed uh, Morocco. A very difficult uh, and traumatic move. Uh, and you're trying to figure out what you can pack and what you need. And to think that uh, heavy shellac records would make it into the suitcase um, is, is something to think about. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Great to have you. Thank wonderful you. talk. Wonderful book. Um, you found so many treasures in homes and co you know, private collections and cafes and uh, company um, papers and so forth. So I'm wondering, do you think that um, as you journey around looking for material, Montreal, Los Angeles, Tel Aviv, etc., do you think about how much must be lost? Or is it more that it's a miracle that everything has survived? And how, how do you assess why people saved the things they saved? And what, if you were to speculate, which is impossible to do, <laughs> what, would, what do you suspect has been lost? So uh, thank you. A good, uh, easy uh, question. <laughs> deep into the uh, philosophical. Um, so I think about both. Um, every record that uh, remains until the present, uh, I, I find it to be sort of, you know, a, a miraculous act that it, that it survived. Uh, and not just that it survived, that it's often uh, playable and, and sometimes in, in rather pristine condition. So um, that's on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, um, 
in theory, a great deal has been lost. Um, and, you know, there are, there are the records themselves, um, but there was also, you know, uh, all of the ephemera that went with them. Um, so the sleeves that they were placed in, uh, company catalogs, right, listing um, uh, records that um, uh, uh, were released, um, uh, uh, concert posters, uh, which existed already, you know, at the end of the 19th century, but also the, the 20th century uh, as well, uh, photographs. Um, and, um, and so I guess the way I approach it is that um, I think there's still much more out there, um, but we're sort of at this, this final moment of gathering. Um, and so um, um, I, you know, some, some, of, some of what makes me sort of like optimistic and, and pessimistic at the same time is, you know, there, there have been moments over the years where um, I visited with someone in, in Paris. I'm, I'm thinking of one woman in particular who was already, uh, this was, you know, 10 or so uh, years ago. She was in her mid 80s at the time. Um, and I, I don't think she's still with us. And she was the, the daughter of um, the, the foremost pianist uh, in North Africa, uh, someone by the name of Masoud Habib. Um, and she had memories, uh, and she also had a dozen photographs that I had never seen before, um, that I also photographed, um, and that I now believe are, um, the originals are now lost. Um, maybe they're with, uh, scattered among uh, family members, and you take a couple, you take a couple, you take a couple. Um, and so that's that's quite um, that's quite disquieting um, because um, there's the potential to gather at, at various moments and then and then suddenly uh, life circumstances sort of uh, sort of takes that uh, away. Um, again, at the same time, uh, I still am encountering people, whether in person or online, who say, "By the way." You know, the person you just wrote about, that was my great grandfather. Uh, and I have three recordings, and uh, this, this, um, this great uncle has uh, a portrait of him. And so um, those materials are, are continuing to materialize. Uh, I guess one of the questions um, that um, lay before us is, is sort of how to gather it, where it should be housed. Uh, questions of accessibility, um, um, also context, you know, not just sort of um, placing images online without their, uh, I'm looking at Rachel again, sort of, without uh, uh, metadata on the back end, but also sort of like what is happening in this image, because we know that, that images uh, can take on lives of their own uh, and sometimes sort of not in the ways in, in which they were ever uh, intended. and so. Um, that's something that I think about a lot. That I'm sort of I'm I'm doing my best with with limited uh, uh, resources, um, but I I think renewed interest to come back to your uh, comment is going to help surface uh, much of this material. The sort of um, this recognition. Um, you, sometimes you, I think you need that chorus of voices uh, beyond your own family to say, yes, that material is important. That material is important. It means uh, a lot. Uh, and um, it needs to be sort of uh, either uh, uh, brought out of the attic or uh, basement, uh, or it sounds need to be amplified. And so I would say I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that even if, as we're at this last moment together, we still can gather. And now the question is sort of, uh, where and, and how um, that, that's going to be held in, in perpetuity. Okay, we're gonna have two, yeah, two last questions, yeah. Thank you. Um, Dominic Kumbashan, um, historian, but mostly working with photographer cars. My question is um, really short. It kind of connects to that. Whether you could maybe elaborate a bit on where you started uh, looking for these sources. So you said about uh, 
you know, record store to the Blanca. So what was the starting point trying to gather your, your collection for your research? Um, I understand that at some point you got a certain dynamic where you found like you had contacts and you know it happens it's similar with photo collections, I guess. Uh, but that would be interesting for me. I'm not familiar with the region at all. Uh, and also um, whether you could say something about what has been like stored in archives. So in general the material question. Well, so let's take the first question. Okay. Yep. And then we can Hi, I would like you to uh, touch upon what's happening nowadays in music between the, the Jewish uh, music, the Moroccan music, and I know that there are a lot of uh, orchestras and bands that play. Uh, are they popular and, and are they uh, sought after uh, internationally? Um. Uh, to, to start, um, so the, where do we begin? I, you know, the question of archives here is, is important uh, because uh, a sort of a, a natural starting point for historical inquiry might, might have been uh, a phonotech, uh, sort of a, a place where these records uh, were held in, in Morocco, Algeria, uh, or uh, Tunisia. Um, and that's a challenge, um, you know, to begin with de the, the process of decolonization, which uh, meant that uh, not all of the archives, as, as we know, but many of uh, uh, the archives were, were brought back to, to metropolitan uh, France uh, with the departure uh, of, of the French. Um, if I had been able to start this work in the 1960s, um, which would have been hard, but uh, it, it would have been, uh, in theory, easier to access these phonograph records in their original archival spaces. Um, so if you think about the radio stations in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, um, they had uh, archives, they held uh, records, uh, and over the years, owing to a number of factors, uh, including things like a civil war in Algeria, uh, but also sort of the, the twists and turns of decolonization, uh, reduction in funding for radio stations. Um, it's meant that uh, many of those sort of spaces where we might have thought these uh, types of records would be held um, are empty. Um, and uh, that's not to say that they were discarded, uh, but that is to say that they're, they're probably in, in individual hands uh, now. And this is not a story that's unique to this region. This is a, a story that's um, a true of, of many, of many, uh, of many places. Um, and so that makes, of course, the task difficult because it's a dispersed um, collection. And of course, uh, radio stations, especially colonial radio stations didn't hold everything, right? They wouldn't hold uh, music that they deemed to be subversive or anti-colonial uh, nationalist. Uh, and so um, this has meant that I sort of, as best I could, I had to innovate in terms of uh, locating uh, records and sort of uh, fashioning an, an archive of, of some sort. Um, and then, of course, I have to make decisions about sort of what does this archive look like, uh, right? I'm, I'm in the story in other ways as well. Um, you know, one question is, is any of this Jewish music? Um, Jewish performers, yes. Uh, but what would make this Jewish music, which again is a question uh, not just related to North Africa and the Middle East, but we can uh, see this in, in the Eastern European and Central European context uh, as well. A very difficult uh, question. So we can point to certain things, and ethnomusicologists are much better at pointing to things like uh, timbre, uh, types of voices, uh, 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 forms of pronunciation, uh, the way that some Moroccan Jews spoke, but not all. Samuel Maghrebi, who we've invoked a number uh, of times, who uh, this uh, crooner of, of the 1950s, sort of a rat, Moroccan rat pack rolled into one, who eventually makes his way to Montreal, where he becomes the Chazan, the cantor at the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue there. Um, his Arabic pronunciation is not Moroccan Jewish pronunciation. He wanted 
in, in his estimate, a higher form. He wanted sort of a standard form, and that is what he aspired to. Uh, and you look at some others, um, Sheikh Muijo is, is someone who, who's, yes. whose Jewishness can be heard, yeah. uh, but whose music isn't necessarily uh, Jewish. So, um, so this has meant uh, that uh, uh, record stores wherever they existed was, were sites that I uh, visited. Uh, um, poor me, uh, Parisian flea markets uh, and, uh, and, and the like. Um, uh, individuals who reached out and said, I have this, are you interested, would you like it? So I said yes. Uh, and uh, eBay. Um, eBay and sites like that. Uh, which, again, to talk about um, sort of future directions, the, the, the question of how all this music moved, you know, so survival, but how it moved. Um, so there are moments where I've um, happened upon a Viva Masika record uh, uh, in a particular sort of like um, pioneering shop in, in Istanbul. Okay, so someone who has figured out how to sort of put all of their uh, antiques online so that if by chance uh, you, 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 pu you punch in the right code, you'll happen on this uh, in a store in the bazaar of Istanbul. Yeah. Um, how Habiba Masih, T Tunisian records from let's say 1928 uh, reached their way to uh, Istanbul uh, and were held uh, for, for many decades is, is a question that also animates me, so this question of, uh, of movement. There are some spaces where um, uh, great numbers of these records are, are held. So um, uh, the, um, the National Library of France has many, not all, but has many uh, records uh, in its holdings. Uh, but then the question is, you know, how does one access them? Um, and this, is, this becomes sort of the problem of, of archives. Um, uh, and they have done an excellent job, the BNF has done an excellent job of uh, digitizing uh, them. Um, also, the, um, um, there is now uh, a phonographic uh, archive in Tunis as well, um, uh, which has some uh, thousands of records, not all 78s, but thousands of records uh, in, its, in its holdings. Uh, and, and here, uh, also, that's very important, but it's also a question of, of access, uh, in which most people don't have access to those holdings, even as they're digitized. And then the question is, uh, uh, is, you know, is a single copy of a record in one archive sufficient? So no is the short answer, and, and why? And it's because people approach um, uh, the process of digitization differently. So I mentioned at the, this is, this is the, the comedian's callback that I'm so good at. At the beginning of this uh, talk, I, I mentioned that there was a spoken announcement at the beginning of these records, where they would say the record label is uh, and then whatever it is. In some cases, in the process of digitization, uh, archivists have decided to chop that off because they deem it to be irrelevant to the music. I would say otherwise, and so um, thus I've been gathering as best I can with all of the problems uh, of the individual archivist, and, and someone later will come along and sort of figure out all, all of my uh, individual uh, archiving quirks, but that's some, some of the story. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to see you. Um, uh, the, 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 popularity or sort of the resurgence of interest uh, in uh, North African music in, in Israel and among Jews uh, from North Africa has certainly been gaining steam uh, over the years. Uh, one thing I would say that has pushed it into sort of hyperdrive is the Abraham Accords. Um, and so these are, you know, the, the bilateral um, I'll use the word accords, the bilateral <laughs> accords between uh, Israel and, uh, and Morocco, uh, Israel and a number of, uh, of Gulf uh, countries, uh, which has meant that uh, one form of, of diplomacy that has been enabled is, is cultural diplomacy. It's sort of, uh, it's a soft form of diplomacy, it's an easy form of diplomacy. So all of a sudden, we see uh, Andalusian orchestras from Jerusalem, Ashdod, uh, other places, uh, appearing in the UAE for the first time. 
uh, or appearing in Morocco for the first time. And this is, of course, quite uh, meaningful for these uh, young musicians, often young musicians, who are returning home uh, to the place that their grandparents may, may have been uh, musicians for the first time. Uh, or used to be uh, musicians. Uh, the, the, I think the popularity of some of this music in, in Israel is, is, uh, is, is clear, uh, especially um, if it sort of moves beyond the traditional, right? If it's sort of innovative, if, if it's bringing in um, other styles and traditions that are more uh, contemporary. There are some of these musicians who are also uh, popular in Morocco, for example. Um, Netar Kayam is, is one of these, uh, of, of these artists who has a large uh, fan base. Um, and um, I think her success has been that she um, understands that um, culture and tradition changes. Um, so she's writing her own music in Moroccan Arabic. Uh, as a, as a non-native speaker, but still uh, 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 really doing an incredible job with it, um, and you find that there's this this interesting synergy and back and forth. So there's certainly interest. Um, we're certainly in uh, in a moment, um, and um, I don't I don't know what the what the future will hold or, or if it will continue, but um, it's it's exciting in its own way. I have heard. Uh, on a conference uh, a few years ago, Moroccan uh, musicians, Muslim, playing with Jewish musicians. And that was very emotional. And I think that there are, because I just curveballed, there was an orchestra that came a few years ago as well. Uh, and I think that the symbiosis between them was something that uh, was incredible. It, it, it sounded and looked like if they had been playing together forever. They knew each other's uh, rhythms and uh, yeah, everything. I, I, it's and an improvised. And so I was wondering whether there was an interest in uh, Europe or North Africa of, see, of, of having those uh, bands or, uh, you know, touring or uh, if, if there was were popular, or if it was just a, a fluke thing that I happened to to no, it's not a fluke. Uh, I, I guess I could say one last yeah, yeah. word on this is that um, uh, sometimes it feels like this history is a rupture, um, and, and, and depending on sort of where where we want to uh, draw draw the line in time, the 1948, 1956, 1962. Um, I, I'm not of that uh, school of, of thought, as, as one can see in the book, um, but. This story of Jews and Muslims seeking each other out um, as, as colleagues and sometimes competitors, but something that's sort of productive for the quality of the music, uh, continues uh, into the 60s, into the 70s, uh, into the 80s. Uh, Reynette Lorenez, uh, one of the great uh, Algerian artists, Algerian Jewish artists, uh, with uh, Mustafa Skandarani, uh, uh, the great Algerian Muslim pianist. I mean, if you, you just need to find uh, an image of them on Google to see sort of how this story continues into to really late in the game. And then when you're searching for the rupture, it then becomes hard to find because it brings us to our, our present moment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Chris. I want to I wanna end by really uh, uh, thanking you so much for all the incredible work you're doing. Uh, and for I learned so much from this book. I've read it four times, and every time I read it, every time I read it, I see something different. So it's really it's incredible work, and we're looking forward to more of your work. And uh, please join me in thanking Chris, and we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thank you.